Welcome back, and it is time to try the gain settings on these amps. And so I have switched from the Strat in E flat to a Les Paul in standard. And uh, again, I'm gonna keep this pretty simple. It's not about flashy licks, and I won't be able to show all possible styles. So if you are a jazz guy or a death metal guy, this probably won't appeal to you, though I don't think too many jazz guys are going to be going for the high gain stuff. I'm going to keep this kind of meat and potatoes just for the basis of comparison. And, you know, if, uh, there, if you're otherwise intrigued, but you wonder how it would do for a particular style, go and play one. I, I'm not here to, to do full demos. I'm talking about the technical aspects, reliability, and just feature set. And, and I'm kind of, you know, what's the best way to put it? I design amps myself. And so it's always interesting to me when people get things right. What did they get right? When people get things wrong, were they, was it a good idea that went sideways? Or was it, you know, I like to know what people's intentions are. I'm really waiting to see what the mid spot on this channel does at the higher gain. Maybe it, it does something that's not apparent at the lower stuff. So I'm going to start with the tweaker. And we're gonna keep the master in modern mode because the, the vintage sucks. And we're gonna start with the tone stack at, at noon at USA settings. And we'll play around with the bright and deep. And we're just gonna switch over from clean to hot. I'm gonna stay on the bridge on the Les Paul for this. I'm not gonna mess with the volume or tone on this. Let's go to AC. Brit. Right here, if you look at these tone settings, you'll know that this is not, in fact, a Marshall, because this would be taking our freaking heads off if this were a Marshall. Um, let's see how bright and upper mid range we can get this thing. At least at these uh, moderate overdrive settings, uh, we're not getting anything that would be mistaken for a Marshall, but that does not mean it's bad or not useful. Let's see what it's like with the master up. It is quickly apparent to me that like most amps with a pre-phase inverter master volume, you lose gain and, and harmonic response when this is turned down too low. So it's probably from about three o'clock to five o'clock is where you want to keep it. The 
because if you do the proverbial bedroom thing. It just loses all its warmth. You know, if you need to use this thing at home and you need to be quiet, use a pedal to get all the other stuff because the amp will not do all the other stuff at uh, bedroom levels. So let's turn this thing up. Let's set this kind of like, if, I'm, a, I pretend, I'm going to pretend that this is a Marshall. Just do the tone stack about two o'clock, two o'clock, 10 o'clock. Keep it on Brit, we're gonna keep it bright, we're gonna keep it deep. I think that's a pretty good indication that, is this a Marshall? No. Does it sound like a Marshall? No. That sounds really good. If I needed to play live or in the studio and I had one of these on hand, I'd be quite happy with the sounds I was able to get. And people not well versed in Marshall would probably think that sounds authentic. It sounds quite good, but you'd have to be in a place where you could play at least this loud. <laughs> Now, how that really sounds is also going to depend on your speakers and your cabinets and all that fun stuff. Um, most people playing a little tweaker are not going through a big 2x12. Uh, same for the boogie, which you're hearing through the 2x12 at the end, we'll hear it through its internal 10 inch speaker. It's a different, different game. But uh, I think that's pretty nice. It, does it do everything perfectly? No, but you can get a Fender sound, you can get a Marshall sound. Huge asterisks on both those things, but in a band context, based on what people think things sound like, it works great. I'm not sold on the AC thing, but there's some mid-range things there that could be really cool, the Telecaster. I'll just leave it at that. Let me uh, move over to the Mark 525. All right, before I go f uh, with the uh, high gain stuff on the Mesa, I wanna point out again, like all Mesas, there's a higher noise floor on the clean stuff. I moved the mic, sorry. There's a higher noise floor on the clean stuff than there is on the dirty stuff. How do you even do that? That takes a lot of bad engineering to get your clean channel noisier than your, your high gain channel. And I find that in a lot of mesas. So here's the Mark II C+. <laughs> And even as, as lower gain stuff, it's got more on tap than the tweaker did down about 9, 10 o'clock. It's just got a lot more gain, but sometimes you don't need as much gain as you think to cut. You can get mushy beyond, above that. Let's see. Let's go about... I guess we'll just do gain at about noon for the first comparison of all modes. And I'm gonna try to try to get this to sound kind of good. All right, right off the bat, this doesn't sound anything like. Um, a Marshall. This sounds like a Mesa. Uh, this is the 2C Plus. It's in that vein. It's got that upper mid-range thing. It's very saturated. It wants to play Scorpions. I don't know any Scorpions stuff, so I can't play that for you. <laughs> I'm 
sitting awfully close. So I'm gonna turn the master down just a little bit, maybe get rid of that pickup squeal from the unpotted pickup. <laughs> All right, so it's a very 80s kind of overdrive. No, no, you know, it should be. That's one of the amps that dominated the 80s. Let's go to the Mark IV. You can hear it, it's got even more game. It's got that Santana thing. Uh, I don't play like Santana. I would, I could fake it a little bit, but it's not necessary for this. But both the Mark II C setting and the Mark IV setting on this have got that mid-range thing happening. It's like a weird resonance peak. You know, my weird is you're fantastic. Someone's gonna fall in love with that. Uh, but it's, it's very dominating. And the mid spot doesn't uh, touch it. That's ridiculous that you have a pot that does nothing. I was concerned enough about that mid-range response that I opened the amp back up and I confirmed that it is in fact a 10K audio taper pot for the mids on that channel, just like they intended. And the pot is performing as intended and the resistance tracks exactly uh, to what it should be throughout the entire range of the pot. And while the connections to the board are not lovely, none of the others are either but they are connected and it is going to ground. There's no relay that's not engaging, you know. So that weird sounding mid-range on this channel, channel two, is exactly as they intended. Go figure. I mean, I can hear it doing something. And when I had this open, I already confirmed that it was wired correctly. I don't think it's voiced right. And by right, I mean in any kind of useful way. So if we turn the EQ on, then we can control that mid. And that resonance thing is probably in the 800 hertz range. That 750 is close enough and the 22, the 2.2K helps. So I'm gonna leave the others flat ish and just play around the 750k and i'm gonna duck the uh, 240 down a little and i'm gonna play around with the 2.2 Now we're gonna uh, go back to 1990. I turn the treble up, leave the mids alone because it does nothing. We're gonna boost 6K, 6.6K, and we're gonna duck 80 down, and we're gonna go up on the gain. <laughs> I don't play like Metallica and I don't have EMGs or Black Widow speakers or Hetfield's right hand, but uh, that scoop thing is what you're hearing on all of those records. I'm not sure which mazes were used on that, 
But I bet a Mark IV and a 2C were in that studio. All right, and then it's got the extreme mode, man. Let's set everything to noon and see what the extreme sounds like. Take the uh, EQ back off. It's just more of that six to nine hundred hertz. Ah, ah. And this channel, at some point, maxes out its gain. It just gets more saturated. So let's let's see where the gain actually changes. at one o'clock and it's getting everything above one o'clock just gets thicker and less defined if I were to go down to right about noon and give it some upper mids tame the bass a little bit maybe give it a little more presence <laughs> Actually, gotta turn the gain down to maybe 9:30. Just turn the master up. That actually, forgive the feedback because I'm sitting so close to the amp. I have to to be able to be able to control it while playing. That's actually more usable in a band context unless you're doing very specific genres of, you know, whoa, on everything. Let's see what the Mark II C sounds like at those same settings. Back the treble down a bit. Yeah, each, each mode of this channel has a much different point at which it just hits a wall and then just saturates. And, and again, some players love that saturated thousand pound bumblebee thing. Um, the articulation that can be heard in a, in a band where people don't uh, drop out all the other rhythm instruments when you're doing a solo will probably find that, hey, it, it turns to motion at two o'clock, let's not turn it above one o'clock. Um, those of you who've been playing as long as I have or longer, and certainly many of you play better than I do, uh, already know this, but a lot of guys don't. And um, anytime that they encounter information like this saying, it's okay not to turn it all the way up. Spinal Tap is not necessarily the best user manual for any amplifier um, or for, uh, uh, hinge construction. Uh, let's see what this sounds like with its internal speaker and its reverb. So you just heard uh, through the big speaker and I did not have the reverb on to be fair to the Eggnator so you could do kind of apples to apples. And let's see how this sounds with reverb. Let me hook up the internal speaker. All right, we are now going through the 10 inch speaker. And we are uh, on the Mark II C. I should mention that the speaker mic placement on each speaker is relatively approximate. I wanted to be just off uh, the transition <coughs> from the uh, dust cap to the cone, so we're right with like the edge of the mic on that seam and the, and the center of the of the diaphragm just off that and it's perpendicular to the speaker. It's an approximation. There's, if I were trying to record this boogie with its tenant speaker, 
I would be very careful with the mic placement. This is just, hey, it's about the same place. It's actually a pretty good comparison. So you heard it through the big speaker, here's it through the tank. <laughs> It's got an awful quality to it. That speaker is not handling that level very well, so let's turn it down. Okay, I think this is the G10. Let me verify what speaker this is. Yeah, it's a Celestion G10 that I've, I've had a lot of premature failures with in uh, other amps. It just sounds like it's, the voice coil can't handle the output. It's supposed to be a 45 watt uh, speaker, but... Has no low end whatsoever, even for a 10 inch speaker. Let's go to the, I guess I'll try the, the reverb stuff before I change it over. Sounds like a tiny tank. Let's go to the clean stuff. I'm just gonna stay with the Les Paul for the cleans. They do that as well. I'll just do neck middle. Just for a final comparison, we'll go back to the big speaker. All right, I think that'll do. Uh, the um, reverb tank doesn't sound great. Uh, what you're hearing now is actually the Veteran 30 because the way the mic stand uh, was positioned for the 10 made sense just move it down to the, the uh, Veteran 30. But, you know, Veteran 30 ET65 both absolutely kill this G10. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of, of very small open back cabinets with a 10 inch speaker because, uh, I mean, this thing is physically smaller than a Blues Junior and it's very boxy as a result. It's much smaller than a Princeton. There are better sounding 10 inch speakers, but any 10 inch speaker has got its you know, job cut out for it in this tiny little cab. But this G, the G10, the Celestion G10, just does not develop any lows at all in this. And it's very mid-range prominent, and the mid spot on this does nothing. So you'd have to use EQ to address that, uh, but then you can't use EQ as a solo boost. Um, there are much better sounding speakers than, than the G10. And I'm concerned that this one in particular might be bad because it just has a graininess that I associate with a voice coil beginning to be very, very unhappy. Now, as to Egnator versus uh, Boogie, very, very different price points. Both have fundamental flaws. The Egnator is, you know, they're both PCB. They're built pretty much to the exact same uh, base level of quality. The issue is that on the Egnator, um, you have transformers of unknown make that may or may not last 10, 15 years. They may last forever. Unlike the uh, Big Brother of the 40, this is less likely to uh, have its power transformer die. Um, and, you know, all the pots are PCB mounted, so if anything goes wrong, if you were to drop it on its face, you may have some problems and a relatively expensive repair. 
But you know, you can get these things uh, used well under four hundred dollars. I, th I think new they were like four hundred dollars. I'm not sure. I haven't looked. And this, in, by comparison, is is a Ferrari in terms of its price, the Boogie. But the Boogie, like most Maces, has uh, diodes that are underrated for the current that they they they're uh, that they're expected to provide. And as a result, they overheat and they burn the board and they burn the standoff next to them and they burn the, the, themselves. And uh, they have uh, the board has traces which are physically way too close to each other and they like to arc. Uh, it's got 400 volt coupling caps that all will eventually fail. It's even before it has points of failure. You can hear how, you can uh, hear in this video how noisy the clean channel is. All the hiss and buzz in the clean channel that's not there at all in the gain channel. And that's a function both of lead dress and the fact that they cram so many components so close to each other in this thing. The, if you have two resistors that are touching, any noise in this resistor gets put into this resistor. I'm oversimplifying, so if anyone wants to, well, actually, this is an oversimplification. Moving them this much can reduce noise by a factor of 100 Moving them this much can be by a factor of 500. You get uh, exponential returns with, with distance. In a fender, two resistors may be like this or like this. In a Mesa, they're here. In the tweaker, they're about here. And that's for resistors, that's for traces, that's for capacitors. Every component has its own little noise field. And if you have just the enough distance between all these little noise fields, you don't get that cumulative noise. Uh, the, the egnator is observing that principle. Their PCB is pretty well laid out as far as that goes. Um, Boogie, historically, and certainly here, has just thrown all that out the window and said, now oh, we're going to cram it in anyway. And so, I mean, I will see on forums the Mesa Boogie guys say, oh, that's normal. That's, that's just part of the tone, man. That's part of the... That's like saying a, 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 a Chevy Nova from 1974. Well, yeah, it blows up sometimes, but that's part of the driving experience. So I, I just don't get the call to Mesa Boogie. If, if the sounds work for you, that's great. This particular one, though, is just like... It's got all the worst ideas from history... Uh, and they doubled down on it with this very compact size. So while it does some sounds pretty well, and does some very boogie-specific sounds, it's not going to last. So either amp is likely to fail. If this one fails, it will cost you three, four hundred dollars to replace. This one's quite the investment to take that gamble on. So I'm, I, I cannot recommend the Mark 525. If you understand uh, some of the limitations of the shared tone stack and you know that this is not going to be uh, a lifetime amp, the tweaker pretty much does everything this promises for a gigging musician. You know, if, if you set this to clean and dirty with a foot switch and you have a higher gain pedal if you need to have more gain on tap, this will do it. It doesn't have reverb. Oh my gosh, most mar Marshalls don't have reverb. Uh, you can always use a reverb pedal. You can use this just as a pedal platform. And I will say that for a lot of styles of music, the overdrive in this uh, is more usable in a band context because this is so, so genre specific with that mid thing and the saturation thing. Whereas this is just kind of like a, yep, that's a classic rock sound. Let's go play. Anyway, the, those are my 48 cents. Um, um, if you screaming at your keyboard because what about this, what about that? There's a million videos out there telling you how great this is. Well, go watch one of those.